Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ann Durbin. Um, thank you so much for joining me for this webinar today. And thank you to the Beverly Hills Bar Association for having me. Uh, today, I'm gonna be discussing the topic of genocide and going through a case study as it pertains to the Rohingya, which are an ethnic and religious minority group in Myanmar, also known as Burma. So I'm gonna switch to my slide presentation and work from there and we'll answer questions at the end. It is rather long. Feel free to post questions either in the Q&A or in the chat section and I'll do my best to answer all of them. Um, small caveat, this is my first time doing a webinar MCLE course, so wish me luck. Um, <laughs> I am the Director of Advocacy and Grant Making at an LA-based um, human rights and mass atrocity prevention organization called Jewish World Watch. And I also do the legal analysis for the organization to determine, to determine whether or not um, a particular country situation um, rises to the level of a mass atrocity crime for purposes of our engagement. I'm going to begin sharing my presentation now. Bear with me. Okay. So what I hope to accomplish today is to tell you all about um, Jewish World Watch as an organization and some of what we do here locally in the LA area and also on the international stage. I'm also going to talk about the Rohingya crisis in particular um, give a background on the law of genocide, and then apply the law to um, the situation of the Rohingya. Um, as I said, Jewish World Watch is a um, genocide and mass atrocity prevention organization based here in Los Angeles. Um, we are an expression of Judaism in action, bringing help and healing to survivors of mass atrocities around the globe and seeking to inspire people of all faiths and cultures to join the ongoing fight against genocide. Um, we do our work through three pillars, education, um, mostly in the local community, and um, a lot of it is focused on young people and just arming you know, the leaders of tomorrow with information about the Holocaust and genocide and how to prevent this scourge you know, on, uh, on humanity from perpetuating. Uh, we also do advocacy, um, which is based here locally in Los Angeles with local representatives and senators, but also we do work in DC and in coalition with a number of international um, human rights and genocide uh, prevention organizations. And then we run projects on the ground with survivor populations. So our programming on the ground um, is currently focused in Chad with uh, the Darfuri refugees who fled genocide in Sudan. Uh, about 15 years ago. We also have projects on the ground in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, in Syria, and in the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh. The Rohingya, again, are from Myanmar or Burma, and they fled across the border to neighboring Bangladesh, uh, where they live in, um, about a million of them live in a constellation of 34 camps today. Uh, our advocacy work, really touches all over the globe whenever there are populations that are either at risk of or actively suffering, suffering or subjected to um, genocide and mass atrocity crimes. Uh, most recently, we've been focusing on the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, China with the Uyghurs, um, Syria, Yemen, Sudan and South Sudan. So we really um, kind of have a, a real uh, global effort underway. Our work on the Congo largely focuses on drawing attention to mass atrocities in the eastern provinces of the Congo, South Kivu, North Kivu, and Ituri provinces, 
um, our projects on the ground are really about helping war affected populations create a bulwark against future cycles of violence. Um, a lot of our work is prevention focused, either promoting attitudinal shifts among local populations um, to change behaviors like gender-based violence, which has commonly been wielded as a weapon of war, and also the um, forced recruitment of uh, child soldiers, for example. And we do a lot of education work on the ground, um, you know, in an effort to empower future leaders um, who can kind of change the status quo and rehabilitate the country and uh, create protections against future mass atrocities. Um, in Syria, we've been very actively advocating around um, the civil war there that has now entered its 10th year. Um, most recently, we've been focusing on raising awareness of the mass atrocities being perpetrated against the civilian population in Idlib, which is the last rebel stronghold. It's been heavily bombarded by um, the Syrian regime with the help of Russian aerial um, support and um, the civilians have just been relentlessly pummeled and civilian uh, infrastructure has been um, purposefully targeted. Um, we've also um, criticized the pullout of US troops and the ethnic cleansing of Syrian Kurds by Turkish um, and Turkish affiliated troops. And our projects on the ground um, are really focused on bringing medical supplies directly into the hands of doctors that have largely had to go underground in Syria um, to serve the population of Idlib as it continues to be decimated by the bombing campaigns. Um, in Sudan, we've been covering the recent people's revolution and it is, as it has unfolded um, on the ground. Uh, as some of you may have seen, um, a, you know, a genocidal maniac Omar al-Bashir was finally ousted and um, the country has been in the process of transition from, you know, autocracy to civilian rule. There have been a lot of bumps in the road, but we've been very engaged on advocacy efforts uh, pertaining to this civilian um, transition and also the normalization of relations with the United States. In terms of our um, programming on the ground, we are still very much engaged with the Darfuris. Um, Jewish World Watch was born in direct response to the Darfur genocide. And we have um, stood in solidarity with this atrocity affected population ever since. We still work with them in um, the camps in Eastern Chad. There are about 350,000 Darfuris still there. They have still not been able to return home to um, neighboring Sudan. And um, what we do there is try to combat the food insecurity issues that have emerged um, as humanitarian aid organizations have pulled out in order to deal with other crises. Um, food insecurity is really an issue for these Darfuri refugees. So we've been um, empowering them with permagardening skills to teach them how to till the arid soil um, uh, so that they can have year round food producing garden, gardens to supplement the ever decreasing food aid that they receive. And um, these skills would be transferable should they choose to return um, to Sudan once the transition is hopefully solidified. Um, the Uyghurs are an ethnic Muslim minority group um, that has lived in uh, China for generations. And um, they are currently being subjected to what Jewish World Watch has designated as crimes against humanity. Um, at first, it seemed like a cultural genocide was very much underway with, with just the, the stripping of the Uyghur culture um, and the incarceration of Uyghur um, leaders, um, thinkers, uh, artists, activists. Um, but since more and more has kind of leaked out about what uh, the Chinese Communist Party is doing to the Uyghurs, it has become um, resoundingly clear that they are actually being subjected to crimes against humanity. Um, up to three million Uyghurs are, certain, are currently um, interned in concentration camp-like uh, um, facilities throughout the uh, East Turkestan. 
it's also known as the Uyghur Autonomous Region. And um, those Uyghurs that are not in captivity um, are subjected to an Orwellian surveillance state in that region where every move is monitored um, and they live under constant fear. So we were one of the first organizations um, to identify both the cultural genocide and the crimes against humanity. Um, and we played a big role in getting the Uyghur Human Rights and Policy Act passed. Uh, the newest incarnation of that bill just passed uh, both the House and the Senate, and we're waiting for um, President Trump to sign off in order for it to actually become a law, which would be a, a, a monumental victory for um, the Uyghur community um, here in Los Angeles, and also obviously for their nearest and dearest um, still stuck in this atrocity situation in their homeland. Um, in all of our work, we have partnered very closely with the diaspora community here in the LA area. Um, as you can see on the slide, there's a photo here of one of the rallies, the protests that we um, held in partnership with our Uyghur brothers and sisters here in Los Angeles. So that's kind of a, a smattering of the kind of stuff that we do, um, uh, both here locally and internationally. Um, a big focus of our work rec recently has been on the Rohingya crisis. Um, the Rohingya are the survivors of the world's most recent genocide. Um, Jewish World Watch was one of the first organizations to declare it a genocide, and we have staunchly advocated for the passage of the Burma Human Rights and Freedom Act. We also work very closely with the Rohingya diaspora community here in Los Angeles. Here is a rally that we held with them, um, and I think the sign that this young man is holding really um, summarizes why we engage with these causes. Um, you don't need to be Muslim to stand for Rohingya, you just need to be human. Um, uh, and um, just to give, I'm going to get more into the Rohingya situation further on, but um, just to give a, a quick summary, basically what happened is that in August of 2017, uh, the Burmese military, the Myanmar military, also known as the Tadmada, um, you know, staged a massive crackdown against the Rohingya who live in Rakhine State, um, a region in Myanmar. And it, the brutality was just unconscionable um, and led to a mass exodus of up to 800,000 Rohingya in one fell swoop across the Naf River into neighboring Bangladesh. Now, as soon as news of this broke, um, we had been following Rohingya even before then because they, this is a heavily you know, persecuted population that has been subjected to horrific human rights violations um, and even atrocities you know, for decades. Um, but once this happened, Jewish World Watch, you know, mobilized quickly. And what we did was uh, go into the, this, these nascent camps that were just kind of cropping up in Bangladesh and build um, 50 uh, monsoon resistant um, shelters for the refugees. Um, since then, we've gone back into the camps and our programming has shifted to be uh, focused more on filling the critical education gap, which I'll touch upon, um, empowering young people and building communities so that the Rohingya can move from simply surviving to hopefully thriving. <clears throat> and of course, I can't really talk about these areas of work without touching upon um, COVID-19 and um, the implications it has for these already very vulnerable survivor communities that we work with. Um, Jewish World Watch mobilized very quickly in the face of this new challenge, um, sending messages to our local partner organizations on the ground that we would stand with them, help them um, pivot their programming in whatever way they needed and um, offer emergency support. And um, we've, uh, we're very proud of um, having been able to issue some emergency grants um, that have focused on providing food supplies um, and PPNE, which is personal protective equipment, to these communities that otherwise face severe food insecurity um, and have no means of protecting themselves against this, um, this disease. Here you see a woman in a mask. One of the projects that we do in the Congo um, works with uh, women sewing cooperative. Um, the members of the co-op 
are all young women who um, are survivors of gender-based violence um, that it sort of rendered them pregnant with the enemy's child and um, our local partner organization of many, many years um, gave vocational training to these women, um, gave them sewing machines so that they could earn a living and support themselves and their children. And um, I think it's quite poignant that now um, they're creating these masks in order to save their own community members from infection. <clears throat> now in the camps in Bangladesh, the Rohingya camps, um, we're also dealing with a food insecurity issue. Um, food insecurity has emerged as a major, major um, problem um, of COVID-19 response because as many of these countries have uh, mandated lockdowns and shut down marketplaces and told people to remain at home, um, these people who often depend on a dollar a day um, can no longer work for food. Um, and, you know, uh, the result has been a, a really severe food crisis. So food um, provision of, you know, food, um, months, months long supplies has been one of the things that we've emphasized in a number of the country situations where we work. Um, another major uh, challenge has been the, the provision of awareness raising information about COVID-19 um, because otherwise sort of mass hysteria and rumors are, are a, a big challenge to overcome. So um, in the Rohingya camps where there's been a telecommunications blackout since last year, we've tried to empower the refugees with information by working with a partner organization that mounts um, these speakers onto rickshaws and deploys them to all corners of the camps to um, ensure that the refugees have the information to save themselves and their families. So that kind of wraps up my um, uh, um, summary of the work that we do. I hope it gives you some context and maybe inspires you to get involved. Um, now I'm gonna turn to genocide law and kind of give an overview of what that is and then will go through an application of the law to the situation of the Rohingya. Um, so I guess, you know, the first question is, is why, why does understanding genocide matter? Um, I think genocide is a word that is often overused and misused, but um, one characterization that really hits home for me is that it's the crime of crimes. Um, it is othering taken to the ultimate extreme. Uh, it quite literally is the wipe is an effort to wipe the human slate clean of a particular group of people um, simply because of who they are or what they believe. And for me, there is nothing more heinous or egregious um, and nothing that demands our attention um, as much as, as this particular crime. I, I think because it is overused and misused, um, understanding what it means and applying it to the situations that that sort of fit the criteria is is an essential exercise and I'm hoping that um, you know that this will raise awareness among lawyers um, and sort of uh, an understanding of the urgency of kind of getting behind these causes um, it's also incredibly important for those who have been subjected to genocide to, to have the crime that's been perpetrated uh, against them, you know, called what it actually is. And it's vital for triggering an appropriate response by um, other states and for um, getting accountability for what actually happened to these um, populations. Um, Genocide and ethnic cleansing are very commonly conflated and they are not, not the same thing, not by a long shot. Um, ethnic cleansing is the practice, uh, is a practice used to render an area ethnically homogeneous by using force um, or intimidation to remove uh, persons or given groups from the area. It is not an international crime in and of itself. It's not codified anywhere. It's rather used as an umbrella term um, to describe a constellation of acts aimed at removing a discrete population from a particular geographic area. Um, 
The UN Commission of Experts defines it as a purposeful policy designed by one ethnic or religious group to remove by violence and terror inspiring means the civilian population of another ethnic or religious group from certain geographic areas. Um, and, you know, it's important to point out that the intent to render an area ethnically homogeneous is not equivalent to the intent to destroy. So um, even though ethnic cleansing is often misused as a substitute term for genocide, it's important to know that they are very distinct and ethnic cleansing does not trigger the same legal or political obligations for states, um, mostly because it's not codified um, anywhere. So never again um, was of course the rallying cry after the Holocaust um, that never again the international community would allow something like this to transpire. But unfortunately, since World War II, um, atrocities have happened again and again and again and again. And um, many continue to this day. Um, genocides in particular have happened in Rwanda, at Srebrenica, um, Darfur, and um, against Yazidis in, by the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, the most recent uh, genocide is against the Rohingya, um, ethnic and uh, Muslim minority in um, uh, Myanmar. But this genocide is very much ongoing, and I'll touch upon that a bit later. So, the word genocide is actually relatively new. It was created by Polish Jewish scholar Raphael Lemkin um, in response to the Nazi final solution. He felt that there was no existing word to capture the crime's abhorrent scope, um, the deliberate systematic attempt to annihilate an entire population, to wipe the human slate clean of them simply because of who they were or what they believed. Um, so Lemkin combined the Greek word for genus, which is race or tribe, and the Latin word for side, um, which is killing or murder, um, to create this word that almost everyone knows, but few really understand. Um, now, genocide as a crime was codified by the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, which was unanimously adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1948 and came into force in 1951. Um, it's really important to note that, that the creation of the Genocide Convention was one of the very first things that the nascent United Nations did. Um, there, was, there was such an outrage, um, you know, after World War II and what had happened to the Jews that there was this sense of urgency among, you know, the, the members of the international community to, to create a, a vehicle for um, prevention and accountability, and that's what the convention tries to do. There are three elements of, um, of the crime of genocide, and I just want to point out that even though it is codified in this uh, genocide convention, that it, it, it is a use cogent norm, um, and many um, different countries have brought it into their um, domestic legal framework. So the three elements of the crime are protected group, act, and most importantly, um, genocidal intent. So Article 2 defines genocide as any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. Um, one, killing members of the group. Two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Three, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Four, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. And five, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So protected group is of course one of the elements of the crime. Um, it's important to point out that the group must be ethnic, religious, or racial. Um, there were other potential protected groups that were kind of um, debated among the state parties, um, you know, that created the Genocide Convention, but only these three made the cut. 
So other potential protected groups um, were omitted from the list for political reasons. And I'm sure you could think of a whole other, um, you know, several other um, categories that should fit within this, but they were very um, explicitly omitted from the list. Um, if, if political or say gender groups um, or you know, groups uh, around sexual orientation um, were subjected to similar crimes, then that would constitute other mass atrocity crimes like um, crimes against humanity, but it would not qualify as genocide um, per the Genocide Convention. Um, I'm just going to zone in on a few of the um, potential acts um, under, you know, the legal definition of genocide. Um, causing serious bodily or mental harm that encompasses torture, cruel and degrading treatment, persecution, and um, gender-based violence. And um, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Um, the international criminal tribunals have refined this um, to include um, sort of actions that can lead to the slow death of the protected group. Um, courts have looked at the to totality of the uh, circumstances, examining the cluster of abuses suffered by members um, to see whether or not the act requirement is satisfied. Um, with slow death, this is essentially um, the concept of deprivation, severe deprivation, plus time. So essentially restricting and depriving um, systematically and deliberately over a long period of time and just letting nature take its course. Uh, the International Criminal Tribunal um, for Rwanda interpreted this as direct infliction of conditions of life upon a protected group that may not cause the immediate death of members, but will eventually lead to that result if maintained over a period of time. Um, and the, another case um, interpreted this as including um, subjecting the group to subsistence diet, systematic expulsion from their homes, and deprivation of essential medical supplies below the minimum vital standard. So if eliminating the population is the goal, it may be much easier to deprive people of their livelihoods, homes, medical care, humanitarian assistance, and let nature take its course than to institute, you know, a very expensive um, uh, sort of clearance operation or to build concentration camps, for instance. So um, this kind of acknowledges that these efforts can happen over a longer period of time and have more of like a secret and clandestine nature. Um, and it's important to look out for slow death in, um, you know, uh, for, for, the Rohingya in particular. <clears throat> now, um, Akayeshu, a case before the, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, um, acknowledged that rape and other forms of sexual violence can serve as a predicate act of genocide. So um, rape has been wielded as a weapon of war since time immemorial. And it's important to acknowledge that it's not just the actual act of rape or mass rape, um, it's really the intention behind it to essentially destroy the social fabric of the group um, to prevent births by ostracizing women from their husbands and their communities. And also there's, there's a, you know, a, a, a genetic dilution aspect of it with transmitting a new um, identity to the offspring by altering the ethnographic makeup of a community. Um, so the acts and the way that they manifest are really interesting, but the real hallmark of genocide is genocidal intent. This is what distinguishes genocide from every other mass atrocity crime, um, because genocide is truly a crime of intent and not so much of results. Um, it is not necessary to show that a group was in fact destroyed 
or that the particular perpetrator intended to eliminate all members of the group from human society, but you must prove intent to destroy a substantial part of the group. Um, and that substantiality requirement is what makes genocide a mass atrocity crime. Um, but I think the fact that intent is so emphasized in this really speaks to the preventative um, potential of um, the genocide convention you don't really need for the group to be destroyed um, before declaring a campaign of violence to be genocidal. If the requisite intent can be um, evinced from the threat of wholesale, it, it can, can be evinced before um, the threat of wholesale extermination is realized. So this foresight kind of ensures the prevention potential um, of a genocide determination. And the Genocide Convention obliges states' parties to both punish and prevent uh, the commission of the crime of genocide um, for this reason. <clears throat> so uh, because intent is the hardest element to prove, um, uh, a lot of work has been done on kind of teasing out the factors that can be used to infer um, intent from conduct. And uh, the reason why intent is very difficult to prove because you're rarely gonna have proclamations of um, genocidal intent. I mean, of course, this was the case with, with the Nazis and with the Hutus, for example, but um, most of the time it's gonna be more under the radar um, and hidden. So um, the factorial analysis is really um, important for proving genocidal intent. And some general factors that courts have looked to are um, evidence of premeditation and planning, um, the systematic nature um, or coordination of attacks, the scale and brutality of the genocidal acts, um, large scale public propaganda campaigns, cover ups and destruction of evidence, and of course, denial. <clears throat> and I just, you know, just to kind of hammer this in, what differentiates genocide uh, from other mass atrocity crimes, which are of course war crimes and crimes against humanity, is the special ingredient of the intent to destroy. So the most difficult aspect of proving genocide is to demonstrate that, that the intent undergirding the genocidal acts is not merely an intent to forcibly remove members of the group, which would be ethnic cleansing, um, or a desire to harm them because of discriminatory animus, but actually the intent to wipe them out. Um, so these are some of the factors that the International Commission of Jurists and the um, International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and um, for uh, Rwanda have, have sort of identified as helping to prove uh, genocidal intent. Um, the general context of the violence, including the scale of the atrocities, the number of victims, and the repetition of culpable acts, as well as the gravity of the harm caused, um, the use of gratuitous violence. So that would be excessive in a relation to military necessity or to accomplish objectives other than the destruction of the group, the targeting of all members of the group without discretion to age, gender, or involvement in opposition activities, the history of other forms of discrimination or persecutory acts against members of the same uh, protected group, the, metho the, the metho methodical and systematic nature of the attacks, the implication of multiple levels of chain of command, the degree of planning and preparation behind the attacks, attempts to cover up the crime and grant immunity to perpetrators, attempts to bar humanitarian assistance to the victim groups that really fits into the slow death um, act, and then um, the utterance of derogatory language or the issuance of propaganda targeting the members of the group, and the fact that members of other disfavored groups um, are spared or subjected to less destructive forms of violence. And this definitely comes into play in the case of the Rohingya. So with that very brief summary of the crime of genocide, we're now gonna move on to applying um, uh, you know, the law to the case of the Rohingya. So the Rohingya have been dubbed the world's most persecuted people. 
um, as I've said, they're an ethnic and religious minority group um, living in Rakhine State in, inside Myanmar. They've been there for generations and they have been subjected to decades of statelessness, rights deprivation, violence, and disenfranchisement. Um, Jewish World Watch went to Cox's Bazaar last year um, with the intent of visiting existing projects, um, bearing witness to the survivor stories, gauging opportunities for countering impunity, getting the real story about the refugees' needs and wants, identifying uh, gaps in current programming and um, humanitarian aid, and also identifying um, prospective partners for future engagement. I'm gonna go scroll through um, some photos from the trip and just give you a brief background on the Rohingya. Um, here, these photos were taken by me or a photographer um, who accompanied me on this mission. And, uh, you know, I, the things that I, my, my takeaway was really that um, there's obviously kind of incomprehensible need um, and this entire, almost this entire population, the, there are one million Rohingya currently in the camps in Cox's Bazaar, is trapped in limbo between a home country where they would face um, near certain annihilation should they return and a host country, Bangladesh, that is eager for them to leave. Um, and 40% uh, of the population in Cox's Bazaar is under the age of 12. 60% um, are under the age of 18. So there's, you know, risk of an entire lost generation of children here. But despite all of these very sobering, um, you know, facts, the truth is, is that there's incredible um, resilience in these camps. Um, and uh, at least my, in my personal experience, these were the most warm, welcoming, um, inspiring people. And, um, they, they deserve as the survivors of the crime of crimes um, to realize their full potential. And that's what Jewish World Watch's mission really is in this space. Um, so here is a photo of the camps. Um, as you can see, need extends as far as the eye can see. It's, it's literally all-encompassing. There's nowhere that you can be without feeling that you're completely engulfed in it. And um, all of the structures are sort of these ramshackle um, uh, makeshift huts um, put together with uh, pieces of garbage and tarpaulin and bamboo. Um, and just to give some context, Bangladesh is pummeled um, by storms and monsoons. So um, many of these structures end up sliding down the hillside. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty difficult situation. Um, and these are the water sources throughout the camps. Of course, they're contaminated um, and there isn't a lot of pure water, but um, they're used <laughs> in multiple ways. Here, children are playing in, in the water. Um, this is just an idea of, of the congestion. Um, and this is actually one of the more bustling parts of the camps. Some feel more like a no man's land where um, women are kind of restricted to being inside um, their shelters. And there's a real, you know, feeling of, um, of desperation. It's almost like purgatorial. Um, this is one of the families that benefited from um, one of the shelters that Jewish World Watch built in the aftermath of the, of the exodus to, to Bangladesh. Here's one of these structures, <clears throat> one of the families. A lot of our programming right now inside the camps is focused on children. Um, and one of the really interesting dynamics of what's going on um, inside the camps is that um, the Bangladeshi camp authority wants to remove any incentive um, from, for the Rohingya to stay in Bangladesh for the long term. So they've put um, severe restrictions on the educational materials, including um, 
precluding the, the children from learning in their Rohingya dialect. So all of the printed materials inside um, the children's learning facilities in the camps are in, um, in Burmese um, or English, two languages that neither the children nor their teachers speak or understand. So one of the projects that we're doing is bringing um, projectors into the classrooms because audiovisual content is not regulated by the Bangladeshi Camp Authority and our partner organization is creating audiovisual materials with the children themselves so that they can actually learn in their own language. But um, these, these uh, pictures are definitely difficult to see but they kind of capture um, the situation that the Rohingya are facing inside the camps. Now, there are about 600,000 Rohingya that's, that are still inside um, Myanmar right now. Um, about 150,000 of them are in concentration camps, open air concentration camps in Rakhine State. Um, and the situation for the Rohingya inside Myanmar is, is exponentially worse. So a 1982 citizenship law um, stripped the Rohingya of their rights as citizens. It did not list them as one of the recognized um, ethnic minority populations inside Myanmar. So they became de facto stateless overnight, even though the Rohingya had been in the region for generations and were recognized um, after uh, Myanmar um, gained independence from colonial rule. Um, this Citizenship Act in 1982 uh, laid the foundation for um, just horrific persecution against the Rohingya. Um, those still inside Myanmar are, uh, face severe restrictions on movement, on access to education, on reproductive rights. Um, they are only allowed to marry with governmental sanction, and they are restricted in the number of children that they can have. Um, those in concentration camps are, live in, 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 in true concentration camps, but the other, um, you know, 500 or so thousand that are still trapped inside Rakhine are, are living in an apartheid state. It, it is uh, in every possible way. Um, they are treated as, um, you know, subhuman. Um, and this is a view shared not just by those in power, but by um, the majority of the, um, the Buddhist um, population of Myanmar. This gives you a sense of the sort of constellation of 34 camps making up, um, you know, this vast settlement in Cox's Bazaar. You, you don't really know where one ends and the other begins. <laughs> Um, and I think that this photo in particular uh, captures for me the sense of limbo um, that sort of uh, kind of colors the lives of, of the Rohingya refugees. Sorry. But as I said before, um, there, there is hope inside the camps and there is this superhuman resilience that above all else inspires me personally to do this work. Um, here's a women's a vocational program um, teaching them how to sew and this is one of the innovative um, educational interventions that's happening. Um, I should mention that the Rohingya children inside the camps who of course make up 60 percent of the refugee population, um, so 600,000 uh, children under the age of 18, um, they are not allowed to access the Bangladeshi public schools. So all that's available to them are um, these, you know, the, the education within the child-friendly spaces inside the camps. Um, so Jewish World Watch is trying to do its part to work within that matrix and um, kind of restore the dignity of these children and, um, you know, enable them to learn in their own language as much as possible. Um, here I am in one of the 
in, in one of the shelters, it gives you a sense of um, how many people actually reside in these small huts. Um, I think in the age of COVID, it's, it's a pretty sobering photo, even though this was a very joyful moment. Um, I was showing photos of my children to these mothers. Um, I think it just reinforces that we're all human and um, have a, a duty to sort of help these survivor populations and empower them. So here's a summary of kind of what I was talking about. Um, inside Bangladesh, you have a million people in the camps. Um, they, of course, are still stateless with no citizenship. They can't work, they have no freedom of movement, and they can't learn in their own language. Um, Bangladesh has, has numerous times threatened them with repatriation um, to Myanmar um, or relocation to an, an uninhabitable island in um, in the Bay of Bengal called Basanchar, which is pummeled by storms all year long. Um, and the restrictions on the Rohingya have just continued to ramp up. There's now barbed wire fencing around the camp structure. And since late last year, there's been a telecommunications blackout um, so that the Rohingya refugees are, are essentially cut off from the outside world with no cell reception or internet. Um, and they actually can't work for cash. So um, they are left dependent on humanitarian aid inside the camps. Um, inside M Myanmar, of course, the situation is even worse with the apartheid system, the concentration camps, um, full deprivation of rights and disenfranchisement. And there's also an ongoing armed conflict right now in Rakhine where the Rohingya, remaining Rohingya are concentrated. Um, the UN has, um, has declared the risk of genocide to those Rohingya who still remain inside Myanmar as higher than ever. Um, not just Rohingya, but other ethnic minority groups and even um, the, the uh, Buddhist um, civilians inside Rakhine have been subjected to ongoing war crimes um, at the hands of the Tadmada, the Myanmar military, that has been waging an internal armed conflict against um, the Arakan army um, inside Rakhine. So on top of all of this, we add uh, COVID-19. And um, uh, once uh, uh, the initial case of um, coronavirus was detected in Cox's Bazar, which is the city closest to um, the constellation of camps, um, the Bangladeshi camp authority issued a camp-wide lockdown. Um, this was in early March. And since then, the refugees have been surviving with only a bare minimum of essential services. Um, many of the organizations upon which they've come to rely have had to pull out. And um, again, the telecommunications blackout is happening, so they have no access to information uh, about COVID-19. Um, there have been rumors that this is a death virus, that if anyone you know, gets it, they will die immediately. Um, and uh, as of last week, there are 30 confirmed cases inside the camps. So COVID-19 has made its way into, into the Rohingya refugee camps. This was one of Jewish World Watch's worst fears, but we also knew that it was a, somewhat of an ine inevitability. Um, so far, there's been one death, but now there are reports saying that those who have symptoms are actually trying to flee the camps um, for fear of being ro relocated to this silt island in the middle of the Bay of Bengal called um, Basanchar. Um, recently, there were boatloads of Rohingya who were trying to escape the camps, and those, those boat people were essentially moved onto this island of Basanchar, which the international community has widely criticized um, uh, because it's essentially putting these Rohingya into concrete kind of cells. Um, and forcing them to be inside most of the year because of how badly uh, the island is pummeled by storms. Um, and as I mentioned, the Rohingya that are still inside Myanmar continue to be subjected to mass atrocities even um, during the pandemic. And this is being well documented by various international organizations. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about some of the sort of accountability um, efforts that are underway for the Rohingya. 
um, the wheels of justice are finally turning for this persecuted um, population. Um, and a trifecta of cases have recently launched um, all in one week in November of 2019. In, uh, on November 11th of last year, the Gambia filed a case against Myanmar at the International Court of Justice. Um, two days later, human rights organizations filed a case against Myanmar officials in Argentina under the principles of universal jurisdiction. And then the day after that, um, judges at the International Criminal Court authorized the prosecutor to open an investigation into events that originated in Myanmar. Um, so the International Court of Justice is the court of recourse under the Genocide Convention under Article 9. Um, any state party to the Genocide Convention um, can, can bring a claim against another state party under Article 9. Um, and of course, state parties to the Genocide Convention um, promise to not commit genocide, prevent genocide, and punish those who commit it. Myanmar has been a state party to the treaty since 1956. Um, so on November 11th, the Gambia brought the case against Myanmar in the ICJ. Um, the ICJ is, of course, also known as the UN Court or the World Court. Um, my, Myanmar has not lodged any reservations to the ICJ's jurisdiction under Article 9, and neither has the Gambia, so that's why this was possible. Um, the Gambia is a very small African country that is uh, a freshly minted democracy recovering from uh, two decades of brutal dictatorship. Um, and the case was brought because the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General, Abu Bakar Tambadu, um, worked for uh, you know, over a decade at the International Criminal Tribunal uh, for Rwanda. And um, he went to the camps in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, with um, a delegation from the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Um, and he was so moved by what he saw there and sort of the, the parallels with what he had prosecuted for so long um, in the case of Rwanda that he decided to sort of take the lead on this and, um, and bring the case um, against Myanmar, uh, you know, uh, on behalf of the Gambia. And, um, you know, wh while at, at The Hague, he said, we are doing this in the name of humanity. That's why they're bringing the case. Um, we are doing this because we want the Rohingya to be recognized as human beings, for their rights to be recognized in their own country of Myanmar. Um, so the complaint alleges that the Gambia as a state um, violated the Genocide Convention in numerous ways. Um, the Gambia requested a cessation of the genocidal acts, um, prosecution and punishment of those responsible and reparations for the victims. It also um, requested provisional measures or injunctive re relief during the pendency of, of the, um, the case. These are court mandated actions that Myanmar must take um, during the, the, while the litigation is underway to prevent future irreparable harm. Um, now, the case in Argentina um, was filed by um, NGOs, um, and uh, in, including one in the UK representing um, Rohingya and uh, a local organization in Argentina under the country's universal jurisdiction laws. Um, universal jurisdiction, of course, is the concept that certain crimes are so grave as to be crimes against all of mankind. So a number of countries have instituted um, you know, universal jurisdiction laws that allow them to prosecute um, these atrocities inside local courts. Um, the lead attorney on this case is an Argentine lawyer named Thomas Ojea, um, who served as the UN Special Rapporteur for Myanmar between 2008 and 2014. So again, there are these strange sort of serendipitous factors at play with the leaders of this account these accountability efforts. Um, I'm happy to report that on May 29th, Argentina's Federal Criminal Chamber Number no. 1 agreed to pursue the case after initially rejecting it. And the grounds for rejection was because the ICC was also al al already looking into the situation and they didn't want to duplicate the efforts of the ICC. But as I'll go on to tell you, um, the ICC's case is, is rather limited because of jurisdictional restraints. Um, so 
On November 14th, a pretrial chamber authorized um, ICC prosecutor Fatou Bansouda to open an investigation into the situation of Bangladesh, Myanmar, um, but it only granted uh, narrow jurisdiction over crimes against humanity of deportation and persecution um, that had, where some element of the crime happened on the territory of a state party. So because Bangladesh is a state party to the Rome Statute establishing the International Criminal Court, um, the ICC could have jurisdiction to investigate any crimes that were completed um, inside Bangladesh. But that leaves out a lot of other atrocities that were perpetrated um, completely on um, Myanmar soil. So complementarity um, between the universal jurisdiction case and the ICC case is absolutely possible because of the narrow jurisdiction that the pretrial chamber granted um, to the prosecutor in this case. Um, still, it's, it's a monumental victory to even find this sort of loophole for um, investigating um, the situation of the Rohingya before the ICC because the UN Security Council has refused to refer the situation. So um, the only way that the court can have jurisdiction is via um, you know, acts that occur on the territory of a state party to the Rome Statute. <clears throat> um, so I just want to point out a difference between what's going on at the ICJ, the, the International Court of Justice, and the universal jurisdiction and the ICC cases. Um, and that's a difference between genocide writ large and individual culpability. Um, the, the International Criminal uh, you know, uh, Court and the universal ju jurisdiction um, case are both alleging individual culpability in committing the crime of genocide. Um, the International Court of Justice it, it, this is not a criminal proceeding. So it's looking more at state responsibility um, for failing to prevent and for perpetrating um, genocide as a state. So um, uh, this creates two different analyses, right? So um, either the regime intends to destroy the group or a sufficient number of individual actors or actors with appropriate seniority are committing the enumerated acts with genocidal intent. Um, for purposes of, of this um, presentation, I'm gonna focus on um, sort of genocide writ large and whether or not um, the elements are present in the case of the Rohingya. So, of course, I've, I've talked extensively about the Rohingya. They absolutely meet the requirements of element one, being a protected group. Um, their presence in Myanmar predates colonial rule. Um, uh, the General Aung San, the late father of Aung San Suu Kyi, um, who is the current civilian leader of uh, Myanmar, uh, recognized the Rohingya as native people. Um, Burma's first president uh, pronounced, if the Rohingyas are not indigenous, nor am I. And as late as 1954, Burma's first prime minister also stated, the Rohingya are our natural brethren. They are on the same par in the status of nationality with Kachin, Kaya, Karen, Mon, Rakhine, and Shan. They are one of the ethnic races of Burma. But again, the 1982 citizenship law codified their legal exclusion and created the legislative foundation for um, extensive um, legal um, persecution, as well as persecution in many other forms. Um, the people in Myanmar will not even call the Rohingya by their real name. Uh, instead, they refer them as Bengali. And this um, sort of uh, ties into this narrative that they are illegal immigrant interloper terrorists from neighboring Bangladesh um, that have no rights within Myanmar's territorial boundaries. Um, and of course, such alienation reinforces their distinctiveness as a protective group. Um, in terms of the genocidal acts, I'm going to focus just on what happened beginning in August of 2017. In these clearance um, operations, up to 24,000 were killed, 34,000 were thrown into fires, um, over 100,000 were severely beaten, men and boys were separated and disappeared. Um, here's a photo of men who were um, executed and um, journalists who reported on this were actually put in prison um, for many for a very long time. 18,000 women and girls were raped. Um, so the cumulative damage um, 
you know, that this group was subjected to very easily surpasses the gravity threshold inherent in the crime of genocide. Um, also, um, there's a lot of evidence pointing to the slow death of the Rohingya. Um, the final solution it was just kind of the tipping point, and it has to be viewed in the context of many other um, violations intended to bring about the slow death of the group. Of course, I've talked about the apartheid system that has been in place um, since the 80s. There's also been a deliberate deprivation uh, and banning of any humanitarian aid. And um, if you see these satellite images, there's been a, a, a charred earth campaign um, as well. So you can see how the villages, the Rohingya villages, have just been essentially wiped, wiped out. And this, of course, deal goes, goes into evidence destruction as well. But um, really, they're trying to you know, cleanse the land of the Rohingya completely. Um, there was systematic and widespread rape, um, efforts to impregnate with the enemy's child, and um, there were attacks on pregnant women and, and, and babies, um, mutilation and other injuries to reproductive organs, um, essentially, you know, injuring women so severely that they could no longer have sex or conceive. And now I'm going to focus what little time I have left on specific intent, right? So within the, the ICJ context, intent is imputed upon the state as a whole, um, and there must be a finding of state responsibility. Um, so state responsibility for genocide exists when state organs commit genocide or when individuals or entities are acting on the state's instructions or under its direct um, direction or control to commit genocide. Um, previous ICJ cases um, on genocide have fallen short of, of satisfying state responsibility. Um, this was the case in the Bosnia versus Serbia case um, in 2007. Um, and of course, there are two different standards in play, one for failing to prevent and punish genocide and one for the direct state responsibility for the crime. And the Rohingya situation, unfortunately, meets both. Um, I'm going to go through a bit of a factorial analysis here. Of course, there's a long history of othering and persecution from the denial of citizenship to involuntary ghettoization severe restrictions on freedom of movement, marriage and reproductive rights, denial of, an employment, of employment, education and other sustainable livelihood opportunities. Um, propaganda played a huge role in this, um, in this genocide. There have been virulent anti-Rohingya campaigns, especially via Facebook. And interestingly enough, um, the Gambia has just filed a suit in a district court in the District of Columbia um, uh, asking the court to compel Facebook to release all of these um, these uh, postings by members of the Myanmar military, um, civilians, and the, the civilian government. Um, the members of the Myanmar military um, had hundreds of sham Facebook accounts which were used to foment hate and incite violence. Um, in Myanmar, about 90% of the population relies on Facebook as its only news source. So that can give you sort of a sense of, of the degree of the propaganda machinery at play here. Um, religious leaders, monks, were also at the forefront of the campaigns to strip Rohingya of their humanity, and they were equated to snakes, pigs, and worse than dogs. Um, one account on Facebook wrote, these non-human Kalar dogs, the Bengalis, are killing and destroying our land, our water, and our ethnic people. We need to destroy their race. So obviously, these Facebook accounts and postings um, will play a large part in sort of um, helping to establish genocidal intent. <clears throat> There's also evidence of systematic preparations um, Sharp and blunt objects were collected from Rohingya civilians by civilian leaders and security forces in the lead up to the August 2017 crackdown. Um, they were also training and arming um, Rohingya Buddhist community members, tearing down pro pro protective fencing around um, the Rohingya's homes um, and villages, 
and deliberately depriving the Rohingya of food and critical life-saving aid um, in order to weaken them um, in, the, in the ramp up to the attack. Um, military worked with security forces, police, and even local civilians to unleash the brutality in August 2017. Um, so even though the Rohingya have been subjected to prior waves of violence, there was a different ferocity and order of magnitude to the bloodshed that began in August of 2017. Um, children were not spared in the attacks. And as you may recall, one of the factors is, is sort of going after everyone. Um, not only were children not spared, but they were subjected for special cruelties. Um, many of the victims were excessively beaten before they were killed, just pointing to that deep, you know, hatred and animus that was motivating this violence. Um, also, landmines were planted on the, the, the border um, with Bangladesh to, to blow people up as they were fleeing. Um, this kind of indiscriminate, um, uh, bloodthirsty killing is, is very indicative of something, you know, much deeper going on, of, of the possible presence of genocidal intent. And of course, denial is one of the major factors. Um, the Myanmar government has categorically denied the genocide. Aung San Suu Kyi, who was of course uh, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize as uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, just for her, for her um, democratic principles, um, has defended Myanmar at the ICJ proceedings at the, at the Hague. She definitely has fallen from grace for her involvement in this. Um, and once she returned to Myanmar after defending, um, you know, the, the atrocities before the International Court of Justice, she addressed the nation and said, we will overcome every challenge with our seamless unity, solidarity, and bonds of blood, um, blood that the Rohingya do not share. So on January 23rd, um, the 17 judge panel of the International Court of Justice unanimously issued provisional measures against um, Myanmar. Um, it ordered that Myanmar must prevent further violation of the Genocide Convention, um, preserve evidence, and report to the court on its progress implementing the order. Um, Myanmar has done very, very little uh, to abide by these requirements of the court. It ordered uh, on April 8th, it issued very shallow presidential directives, which are very much a sham to all government officials um, to ensure acts prohibited by the Genocide Convention are not committed and that evidence is not destroyed, even though it's continued to bulldoze villages and perpetrate atrocities against the civilian population of Rakhine, um, where the Rohingya are primarily concentrated. A later directive asked officials to denounce and prevent hate speech, which of course has also continued. Um, there have been no guidelines or implement, uh, for implementation or monitoring um, released by the government. Um, it did, however, submit its first uh, you know, mandated report to the ICJ on May 23rd. Um, so that kind of wraps up um, where things stand right now. We, of course, are continuing um, to monitor the situation very closely. And um, in terms of what you can do, um, I encourage all of you to go to the jww.org, take a look at our, our projects on the ground with the Rohingya and also our advocacy efforts, um, which are, you know, moving full steam ahead, even in, you know, the COVID-19 landscape. Um, and there are, we are talking about organizationally trying to, um, kind of engage with these legal proceedings in maybe an amicus capacity. And we do work closely with um, law schools in the LA area. So there's a lot of potential um, to do legal work around the Rohingya cause if um, any of you are inspired to do so. So um, if, if you're interested, please feel free to email me. I'm at ann, A-N-N, -N, at jww.org. And I see that we do have some questions. I know I'm a little over time, but for anyone who wants to remain, um, let's see. I see that we're out of time. So um, unless anyone has any questions that they just want to quickly shoot me. One says revoke Nobel. Um, rev that I think that that pertains to Aung San Suu Kyi. 
and the, the revocation of um, the Nobel Peace Prize. Unfortunately, um, they have refused to do that, um, despite many advocacy efforts to, to achieve that goal. But um, I think holding Aung San Suu Kyi accountable for her complicity in the genocide um, is the next best thing. And um, the universal jurisdiction case that's currently underway and just got the green light in Argentina is um, asking for her to be, um, you know, tried for the crime of genocide. So um, hopefully she'll have her comeuppance. Um, so yeah, that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for taking the time. I apologize for going over and for the connectivity issues. And thanks again to the Beverly Hills Bar Association for having me. Um, I hope that this was informative on the very important law of genocide and the incredible um, Rohingya who are still, you know, striving towards the light and deserve our support in every possible way. Thank you so much.